I'm finding huge apologetic value to noticing these values and saying and saying to my friends who thought that they were very secular, um, you believe in this stuff, don't you? You believe in compassion, even though the way of nature would tell you to live differently. So which do you believe more? Do you believe more in the survival of the fittest? Or do you believe in the sacrifice of the fittest for the sake of the weakest? Which which do you actually believe in? And all my friends, they all my friends, they would they would give up the sacrifice of the of the weak <laughs> in a second. Um to go for this compassion thing. And then you can just start into a conversation about, well, this is a supernatural value. And at that stage, either it is grounded in Jesus or it's grounded in nothing. Which is it? And I'm getting into lots of great conversations in, in those sorts of areas. The Mission Matters Podcast is a partnership between 1615 and Missio Nexus, who have a shared passion to mobilize the people of God to be a part of His mission. Well, hello and welcome once again to the Mission Matters Podcast. I'm Matthew Ellison, and if you're a regular listener or viewer, you know what I'm about to say. I'm joined by my good friend and co-host, Ted Esler. Ted, how you doing, my brother? I'm doing well. I'm doing well, Matthew. Yeah, looking forward to seeing you next week. Uh, we're in the season of Advent, a time where we pause and remember and rehearse the arrival of our King, the first arrival of our King. Of course, we're looking for a second. And I was blessed a couple days ago with a gift on my doorstep that brought back all types of Christmas memories for me. Uh, Lefsa, it was a bag of Lefsa. And if you are Norwegian, you know what Lefsa is. It is a flatbread. It's kind of like a tortilla. And when I had a taste of this, it took me back to my childhood kitchen, rolling out lefsa with my mother. It was just, it was amazing. Um, I almost teared up just tasting the lefsa, thinking of my mother. So Ted, I wonder if you have a memory like that. Well, I could actually use the same memory. Uh, I'm Danish by background and uh, we used to have lefsa every Christmas. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited because next week I'm actually going to bring my mother to Florida for a month. And I bet she makes left for us while she's here. So <laughs> I, I could share that same memory with you, Matthew. That's fantastic. Well, Ted, why don't you introduce our guest and maybe he has an Advent memory he'd like to share as well. Sure. Well, we're blessed today to be joined by Glenn Scrivener. And um, I have read the, his book, uh, The Air We Breathe, uh, about, I don't know, two months back. And it just resonated, uh, I think, with a lot of themes that we're talking about in the global missions community. And so I thought we would bring Glenn on. So, Glenn, I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of a, a kind of an outlay of Speak Life and whatnot. Before we do that, is there a particular Christmas memory you might share with us? And I know we're putting you on the spot here for this, but is there anything that comes to mind? Well, growing up in Australia, I would always have a hot Christmas, obviously. And so uh, we would eat, you know, not your traditional turkeys or that sort of thing. It would generally be kind of barbecues and that sort of thing. And then we'd uh, go outside for a swim and then play some backyard cricket. And uh, yeah, that was that was Christmas for me. You know, feeling the sunburn. That's 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 that gets you in the Christmassy mood, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I'm in Florida, and we kind of experienced the same sort of Christmas here. So, hey, well, Glenn, Glenn tell us a little bit first about your ministry, Speak Life, and uh, what, what the goals are and what's happening with that ministry. Sure. We, uh, we deal in shareable faith, so faith that you can share without shame, without cost, without delay. And uh, we produce all sorts of resources like books, but also like podcasts and videos and uh, whether that's long form uh, video content or short form videos, for instance, at Christmas. Um, yeah, we want to equip Christians because we think that from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So people can uh, check out Speak Life at speaklife.org.uk. And uh, especially we, we've got this new course called 321, which is an evangelistic course that introduces people to the threeness of God and the two-ness of, uh, two of the world and the oneness of you. And uh, yeah, it's just a kind of a Christianity 101 that makes sense in a digital age. So people can check that out by going to uh, speaklife.org.uk. I understand you wrote a book with Justin Shell. So Justin's a good friend of mine. And Justin works with Lasan. Uh, what was that book about? So it's called Come and See. And it's a theology of mission. 
And it, the intention is to have two parts and Justin will do the, the second part probably with somebody else. But um, I, I'm doing the sort of the come and see bit and then go and tell because it is from the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. So it's, mm. it's a fresh look at Jesus that fills our hearts so that we might want to go and tell the nations. So, yeah, go and go and check that that one out. Come and see. Come and see. All right. Well, we're here today to talk about your book, The Air We Breathe. And perhaps you could give an overview why you wrote it. What's the premise behind it? Sure. Um, so we are thinking about flavors and tastes and smells that remind us of, of our childhood. Um, so the Australian atmosphere smells very sweet. And I never recognized that until I left Australia. And I've lived half my life in the UK. And whenever I go back to Sydney Airport, I come out and I smell the air. And it's been kind of mentholated by all the eucalyptus trees. And it's like a cough syrup carried on the breeze, really. And I had never noticed how sweet the Australian atmosphere smells. I had to leave Australia and then come back. And in a sense, the book is about doing that with Western culture stepping outside it for a little bit and coming back to it in order to appreciate instead of the atmosphere, we want to appreciate moral values and intuitions and figure out where they've come from. Because just like with the air that we breathe, we don't notice what is nearest and dearest to us, even though we rely upon it. And with all the moral intuitions that we have, uh, we think that it's obvious and natural and universal to believe in universal human dignity and human rights and equality and compassion and consent, enlightenment, science, freedom, progress. These are the values that I look at in the book. We think they are inevitable. We think that they are just natural human values to hold. But what we need to do is kind of go out of our culture. And largely what I do is go back in time to the Roman Empire and uh, the ancient world and to figure out what their, what the air that they breathed was like and then to do a compare and contrast with the air that we breathe in terms of our gut intuitions and our moral instincts. And I make the case and backed up by a whole bunch of secular writers as well as Christians that the difference in our moral intuitions um, is profound and that it comes from Christianity. And I try to unpack what some of the, the implications of that might be. Well, I will just know for you men out there, we're getting in your daily Roman thinking section right now. So you're getting a chance right. to think about the Roman Empire today. Um, g give us uh, an example of one of those values contrasted with Rome versus today. Let's think about compassion. Um, the Good Samaritan, the way that Jesus tells it, is dynamite, both for the Jewish hearers and if there was a centurion kind of listening in at the fringes of the, of the crowd, uh, I, I think um, everyone would be shocked by the story that Jesus tells. So it's obviously a story of compassion. The, the Good Samaritan sees the man by the side of the road and filled with compassion, he goes to him and, and cares for him. Um, but compassion in the ancient world uh, was a luxury to be expended on those who are nearest and dearest. And that is obviously the case that, that our flesh, um, we don't naturally love our enemies. We don't naturally uh, love those who are distant from us. We might naturally love our friends and we, we might show compassion to those who are nearest and dearest to us when our blood sugar is sufficiently elevated. But if our blood sugar falls, falls or if, our uh, friends and family are, are not uh, completely sweetness and light to us. We, we are not filled with compassion. The ancient uh, Romans, there was a Stoic phrase that says, every day do something to help your friends and harm your enemies. And it's the sort of phrase that's been found on burial plots. And it was uh, a pithy little saying, every day do something to help your friends and harm your enemies. We love the first half of that. And we hate the second half of that. And the reason why we hate the second half of that is Christianity, <laughs> because here comes Jesus and he tells this story. Once there was a guy who fell among robbers and he was left for dead. And if it was an ancient Roman telling the story or if it was an ancient Greek, if it was Aesop telling the fable. We know how the story would go. A, a guy was out late at night where he should not have been. He got beaten up. Idiot. 
don't be like that moron the end you know that would that would be kind of ancient wisdom and and there is a certain mm. wisdom to that know your place navigate life according to your limits and um try to survive as best you can so as jesus tells the good samaritan story the centurion would start to be uh shocked by the story that jesus tells and and obviously um, a traditional Jew, I, I think if you properly read the Old Testament, um, you shouldn't be shocked by Jesus' story, but I'm sure many people were shocked to hear of the priest and the Levites going past the man and not showing compassion. And I'm sure many people would have thought, no harm, no foul. Um, they are keeping up Levitical laws. Why should they extend compassion to this man? Who knows why this man is beaten up by the side of the road? The, the centurion might have just thought, well, fate has decreed that this man be left for dead. Maybe the gods want him there. Maybe the Lord, if you're Jewish, wants him dead. Like, who are you to intervene? Compassion is such an intervention. Who are you to intervene? And so both the classical kind of ancient thinker and the Jewish thinker who wasn't sufficiently formed by the scriptures, they would have been shocked by this story because the third person comes along, the good Samaritan, and he does the Jesus-y thing. He shows compassion. Compassion is like the, the word that most describes the emotional life of Jesus. No, no other word is more used to describe how Jesus feels. And it's kind of this gut-wrenching pity that, that the good Samaritan has and he expends himself and and cares for the man and takes him to the inn to take care of him. And you think, well, why does he, why does he take the man to the inn to take care of him? Well, because hospitals weren't invented yet. Uh, Christians hadn't gotten around to inventing hospitals, but they would do based on the story of the Good Samaritan because both this story and the storyteller has completely transformed our notion such that instead of the survival of the fittest and the sacrifice of the weakest, which is the way of nature, Christians have gotten the idea that it should be, well, the sacrifice of the fittest, Christ, for we the weakest, so that we can not just survive but thrive and pass on a compassion revolution. And down through the ages, that's what Christians have tried to do. Jesus said, go and do likewise. And, and Christians have sometimes somewhat succeeded at, at that. They have often failed at that. But what's fascinating is that the standard by which we judge Christians, in fact, the standard by which we judge everybody, is still that compassionate standard. Even when we fail to be compassionate, we recognize that we've done something wrong. Even when we, when we pass on by on the other side of the road, we recognize we've done something wrong. The Roman wouldn't have thought you'd done something wrong. A certain kind of traditional Jew wouldn't, would not have thought you'd done something wrong if you passed on by. But we all know we ought to show compassion. Why ought we to do that? It's the compassion revolution that Jesus has brought to the world. It's beautiful. You know, I've never heard compassion described as intervention. I'm going to take that, Glenn, if you don't mind. I'm going to lift that. Mm. But I, I do a teaching on Matthew 9 where, you know, he sees the, the harassed and helpless multitudes like sheep without a shepherd. And he has a yearning in the bowels, as you said, that the seat of the emotions was the gut. But I love that intervention idea. It's not just seeing the suffering. It is taking action to alleviate it. It's more than a feeling. So I'm going to lift that from you. It's an intervention. Please do. So, Glenn, yeah. um, our audience, mostly folks in the missions world. And so some of them may be thinking this conversation is really probably limited to a, a Western framework. What are the implications for the global church? Do you have any idea? I mean, one thing it's important to do in missions work is to do some bias training and to figure out where your assumptions come from. And so if, if you yourself happen to be Western and you're, you're conducting mission cross-culturally, it's really vital to figure out that what you take for granted as obvious and natural and universal and just the inevitable ethic of all humanity. Um, I'm sure if you've been in, involved in missions for any length of time, you'll recognize that that, that is not the case. And um, you'll be breathing very different atmospheres around the world. But it's, it's, it's very important to figure out where your moral intuitions come from. I think it's, I think it's also important to really establish that it's not that West is best. And, and my book is absolutely not saying, you know, West is best. 
Um, it is to say that there are a whole bunch of values that we prize and that have come to us through a particular kind of historical development. Um, and it's important to own ways in which Westerners and the Western church have gotten things wrong down through the ages. And I, I try to do that throughout the book and sort of own examples where Christians have just flagrantly not lived up to our own standards, including the Crusades and the Inquisition and slavery and all, all sorts of issues like that. It's, it's vital. Um, it's vital to put our hands up and, and say where we've got this stuff wrong. Um, but I think it's, it's also, you know, it's not just those who have a connection with the Western church that believe in human rights or human equality or compassion or all these things. Um, through westernization and through international law and through lots of different, um, even through like secularization. If you, if you think about somewhere like Turkey or India, um, they have been Christianized in lots of ways, not necessarily because the Christian church has penetrated deeply in some parts of India. Yes, maybe, but, um, through secularization, Actually, lots of parts of the world that, where even even the church is is a is a large minority um, have felt the effects of this historical development in terms of human rights and compassion and consent and and all these things. So I think I think for all all those reasons, uh, it's not just a Western phenomenon that I look at in the book. It's not just West is best, and I think. Everyone needs to do some bias training when uh, when they are ministering cross culturally. So I, I hope the book can help in those ways. So I'm reminded of a conversation I had a few years ago. I was in northern India and I was speaking to a young Indian Christian convert. He's probably about 25 years old, and he had gone to Afghanistan. He was a mosque reader. He'd gone to Afghanistan, a Muslim, obviously, and fought with the Taliban. And when he observed what was happening in that context, he thought this can't be right. Mm. And uh, he literally was a deserter. He walked, a, he walked home from Northern Afghanistan, a dangerous journey of many miles. And the whole time he was thinking about what happened to him there mm. and the horrific morality that he saw played out. And he asked, he was asking himself and he was asking really the Lord, although I don't think he knew it at the time, you know, what is the basis for, for a good moral person to base their life on? Mm -hmm. And through that process, he began to look at these Western liberal values and that led him to seek out Christians and ultimately he got converted. And so this is kind of the apologetic I think that is happening here is that we're trying to surface some of the value in uh, Westernism. Uh, again, I'm with you. There's huge problems and we don't really want to resurrect Christendom. But, you know, you're not alone on this. Um, I think Andrew Wilson, uh, Remaking the World, uh, Justin uh, Brearley, The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. Um, and now recently, um, Ayan Hirsi Ali, hmm. if I got her name order right there, yep. she became a new convert to Christianity. And it seems to me like she's following the same kind of thought process. Mm. She notes a number of times. She wrote uh, an article that's been viewed millions of times now at uh, Unheard, Why I Am Now a Christian. And I guess she must have written that at the beginning of November. And it's a, a play on Bertrand Russell's essay from a hundred years earlier, why I'm not a Christian. And of course mm -hmm. she was a, a, a famous mm -hmm. atheist and new atheist. She had been a Muslim. Um, she came out of a kind of a Muslim brotherhood type um, fundamentalist Islam and then found Western liberal values in uh, the Netherlands. And then in the U S became a new atheist. She um, read Tom Holland's book dominion. And I often, um, describe my own book as my, my, my book is dominion for dummies and I'm the dummy. Um, but Tom, Tom Holland, a <laughs> secular historian basically, um, does in about 600 odd pages, what I, I do in a couple of hundred, which is, um, 
try and do a 2000 year plus history of the Western mind and show how absolutely Christianized it has been to the point where even our criticisms of Christianity are Christian criticisms. Because what do you notice about people when they criticize Christianity is they say it's bigoted, cruel, coercive, unenlightened, anti-science, restrictive and regressive. And you might think I've plucked those seven criticisms out of the air. I haven't. I've just reversed the seven values that I talk about in my book, which is compassion and inequality, consent, enlightenment, science, freedom and progress. And what does it take in order to point the finger and accuse the church of inequality? Well, you've got to have equality as, as some kind of transcendent value. And so actually noticing the values that are around us is, is absolutely it's it's gold dust in evangelism and you you speak of um this muslim man who has started to notice well if i'm resonating with a compassion ethic and if i see that as somehow supernatural because it is kind of supernatural the, the way of nature is the way of dominance and fear and power and the survival of the fittest of course that's the way of nature to prize compassion is to prize the supernatural because because it is entirely above nature in order to protect the weak and try and nurture them. And so, you know, the, the Muslim who you describe is pulling at a thread, which I think has Jesus on the other end of it. And I, either the other end of it, like has Jesus or this this thread is is, you know, completely detached and nonsensical. And I think Ayan Hirsi Ali mentions a number of times, you know, the wonderful book Dominion and the wonderful Tom Holland. And I think he has helped her to frame the things that she has loved about the West, having left Somalia and then Kenya. Her coming to the West, she's now recognized that what she came to was not just this detached enlightenment value. The, the, the enlightenment itself has been detached from, but to some degree an outgrowth from Christianity. And I, th I think she's, she pulled the threads to some degree and found sort of secular liberal values. But I think she's pulling the thread a lot more now and discovering that at, at, the, at bottom, what grounds all of this is Jesus himself. And I, so I, I, I see that that's, that's fascinating, that, that story about the, the, the fighter. Or you could go to Ion Hersi Ali, or you could talk to, you know, my next door neighbor just started a conversation with me about compassion. He just watched this Facebook video in which uh, uh, the water the water boy for a, a high school basketball team in the States was given like two minutes at the end of the season to come on the court and, and play the last two, you know, two minutes. And he was sort of given the ball and he shoots and he misses and he, he was profoundly disabled, this this kid. Shoots again, misses. The, the opposition hand him the ball. He shoots. He scores. The entire gymnasium are on their feet, kind of praising and the lifting up of this kid. And they put him on their shoulders. And and he just, he complete non Christian. He just said to me, "Why is that so amazing?" I was like, "Well, wow, that's compassion, isn't it? It's supernatural." And we got into this wonderful conversation. Let's just pull on the thread of compassion and let's find that at the other end there was the fittest who was sacrificed for we the weakest so that we the weakest might survive and thrive and and so I'm, I'm finding huge apologetic value to noticing these values and saying and saying to my friends who thought that they were very secular um you believe in this stuff don't you? you believe in compassion even though the way of nature would tell you to live differently so which do you believe more? Do you believe more in the survival of the fittest or do you believe in the sacrifice of the fittest for the sake of the weakest? Which, which do you actually believe in? And all my friends, they, all my friends, they would, they would give up the sacrifice of the, of the weak <laughs> in a second, <laughs> um, to go for this compassion thing. And then you can just start into a conversation about, well, this is a supernatural value. And at that stage, either it is grounded in Jesus, or it's grounded in nothing. Which is it? And I'm getting into lots of great conversations in, in those sorts of areas. Love it. So our audience, again, primarily a, a missions audience, but, but I'm curious, when you wrote this book, who are you thinking about? Like when you envision people buying it and reading it, reading it 
who are you writing it for? Tom Holland. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, well, he pro- he promised me he would he promised me he'd endorse the book because so we we got to know each other a little bit, and I sort of thought this is this is the book I'd like him to read and see but from a you know he he's he's basically he has been drawing himself towards church through his thinking and through his writing he's still on a journey but um i i want i wanted tom holland to to read it and and be moved by the the particularly christian direction i take the the conclusion i wanted my father-in-law to read it i i gave him uh dominion one christmas and he's a he's a history buff he loves history but the the book is you know laid on his shelf ever since 2019 and so i, I wanted to write him a book that he would pick up and read and um and he has but quite independently he's become a christian anyway so so praise praise god for that i also wrote it for a friend called um well i'll call her sally in this but um not her real name but she she wants mm-hmm. she once wrote a letter and said to me um glenn i hope you realize i could never be a believer and it just haunted me because she clearly believes in things like compassion and she's a far more compassionate person than I am. And she clearly lives this stuff out and believes in it. So I wrote it, I wrote it for her in the book. I talk about, you know, the nuns, the duns and the ones. So the, the nuns, the N O N E S is those who on a survey when they're asked, what is your religion? They say none. Um, I want them to see that, um, Christianity might be invisible to them, but so is the air that we breathe. Um, you are still dependent upon it every minute of every day. Um, I want them to be awakened to the beliefs that they already have. Sally is already a believer. Um, she thinks she does not have it within herself to be a believer. She already is. And then the Duns, the D-O-N-E-S, uh, those who are just done with Christianity, been there, done that. And I, I want to say to them, don't be so sure that you're done. <laughs> with Christianity any more than you're done with breathing. Um, Mm. And can you, can we both stand shoulder to shoulder and we might have the same accusations of the church. We might find it to be bigoted and cruel and coercive and unenlightened and anti-science and all those things. Um, And I might even have stronger, sharper critiques of the church than you do because I'm on the inside of this thing. Mm. (laughs) but at some stage, can we look at our feet and figure out what we're standing on as we're pointing the finger at church? And that's the sort of the journey I want to take the duns on those, those who are sort of deconstructing. And then the ones, the, the W O N's, those who are won by the love of Jesus. I just want them to see, um, well, for a start, isn't it extraordinary that all these prophecies starting in the old Testament and, and then Jesus himself makes them throughout the gospels that his kingdom will overtake the world. That's pretty extraordinary. I was I was just doing a Bible study this morning in, in Isaiah chapter nine. And of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. You're like, that's quite a prophecy to make in the seventh century BC. <laughs> and, and turns out it's happening. Um, and isn't isn't that an extraordinary thing? And doesn't that warm the cockles of your heart? And and isn't it cool to see that the Jesus that you believe in absolutely has implications for every minute of your day and every minute of your friend's day. No, what, no matter whether they've ever set foot inside a church or clapped eyes on a Bible, <laughs> Jesus is really, 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 really that relevant. So I try to do everything, which is, which is a marketing fail. I know that, but you know, <laughs> I'm an enthusiast. So I, I try everything. Well, that's helpful for me. Maybe, maybe the most relevant question that, at least for me, I've got some people very dear to me right now who are deconstructing. And I, I get emotional thinking about it. These are people that I've walked with, people that I've worshipped with. And they're just, they've arrived at that place where they're scrutinizing Christianity, exactly what you're saying, the church is bigoted. And um, maybe this is a divine setup that Ted, you know, was the instrument in because I, I perused your book. I've not read it yet. I'm going to read it because I trust Ted's instincts and what he says, but um, gosh, I'm going to pick up your book and maybe deliver it to some of my people that I love that are in that deconstruction state. Okay. So thank you, brother. Well, I'll pray for them. I'll pray for them. Yeah. yeah. As we, as we uh, kind of wind down here, Glenn, we usually do a segment at the end called something I like. And I'm going to give a couple something I likes here for our audience. The first would just be that book Dominion 
that Glenn just mentioned is epic. And if you work in ministry, you really need to get that book and struggle through it. It's a long read and there's stuff in there you're not going to like. But it is uh, just a uh, breathtaking span of Christian history that I think we all need to take in. The other, the other thing that Tom Holland's obviously probably most known for is his podcast, The Rest is History. Hmm. And it's probably my favorite go-to podcast. There might be a new one coming up, but The Rest is History is well worth listening to. Um, you know, I'm Danish. My background is Viking. Read the, just listen to the two episodes on the Vikings and you will be absolutely blown away. Uh, that's awesome. But the other podcast that I'm starting to like and something that I like is this one called Post Christianity. Uh, Glenn, could you tell me about that podcast that you're part of? So it's myself and Andrew Wilson, and we both happen to live in the same small town on the south coast of England. He He literally lives about 200 yards that way. And uh, we got wow. together in a studio. Yeah, it's cool. Um, because, I mean, he's just a sensational author. He's, he's just written a book called Remaking the World, uh, all about how 1776 kind of shaped all the moral assumptions and, and, and everything about uh, the modern world. And uh, so his, his book, um, well, it's a deep dive on 1776 and the ways in which um, the influences, not just in America, but in Britain as well and, and around the world, that, that was a, a particularly post-Christian moment. Um, Post-Christian, not that um, you can ever kind of get rid of the Christian influence um, on the West, but that certain there were certain developments that had moved beyond Christianity in, in, in different ways. And so, yeah, we talk about our, our two books, really, and we get some great guests on. We, we talk with uh, Carl Truman. Uh, we talk with Rebecca McLaughlin. Uh, who else do we talk about? Um, yeah, and and so it's it's over eight episodes, and uh, yeah, we we hope it it puts a kind of a, a pin in the map and says we are here historically and culturally in this moment for reasons, and we can learn from those in the past who have ministered it at, at similar junctures in time uh, in order to get our bearings and minister for Christ today. It's great. Well, very, it's been an eye opener for me listening to it. Hmm. I feel pretty well versed in Christian history and Christian thinking, but I've never heard anybody like the two of you do unpack kind of the origins of postmodernism in the way that you do a number of things that are currents in Christianity. So uh, just a stellar job on that. And I would really recommend uh, listeners go find that podcast and give it a listen. Mm. Oh, so what have we yeah. learned here today? Um, the values that are in the air that we breathe, we take them for granted. Um, and if we pull on those values, I love what you said, those threads go all the way back to Jesus. Hmm. Thank you, brother. It's been a great conversation. Pleasure. Thanks yeah, for having thank me. Thank you. Lord bless. Thank you. Before you go, be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. The Mission Matters Podcast is a partnership of 1615 and Missio Nexus. Check out 1615.org and missionexus.org for more resources on the mission of God and the matters of the mission. The Mission Matters Podcast is hosted by Matthew Ellison, President of 1615, and Ted Essler, President of Missio Nexus.